Our scripture this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. We're going to read verses 18 through 22. Hear this familiar reading now. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say together, thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. This is the second week for us in our sermon series that we are calling A Living Sacrifice, which will be our worship theme and really our theme as a church for this next month. October is the month every year for us here at Bluff Park where we spend a little bit of time talking about stewardship and hoping to reevaluate together how it is that we are stewarding over our lives, meaning how we steward over our time and our talents and our energy and our resources and our money. And this month, we are spending our Sundays reflecting specifically on the call that our faith places upon us as followers of Jesus to steward over those things sacrificially. This is all going to culminate for us on October 27th. That's the last Sunday of this month. It'll be our Commitment Sunday. That's when we're going to make our financial commitments to this church for the next calendar year. And we're going to have a free pancake breakfast. And the children's choir is going to sing and worship. And we're going to have our Trunk or Treat Festival that afternoon. So it's going to be a really, really fun day. And I am very excited to get there. But I'm also excited for the journey there. I'm really excited for the journey there, actually. I hope that you've had the chance to watch the first of our three stewardship testimony videos that we released on Friday. It's on our YouTube channel. We posted it on social media. It was in our weekly update email, and we're going to send it out again this afternoon. These videos each week leading up to Commitment Sunday, they are going to highlight members of this church as they share the impact that sacrificial giving has had on on their faith. And let me tell you, these videos are full of folks sharing how giving has transformed their walk with Christ. And I really hope that you'll take just a few minutes to watch them. I also believe that this is a really important conversation for us to be having in general. Because I I talked about this a little bit last week, but I want to say it again. The more that I've thought about this and reflected on it, this concept of sacrifice, the call to sacrifice, making sacrifices, living sacrificially, all that stuff... When we flip through the pages of Scripture and see how many times it comes up over the course of the narrative, it is something that should be pretty high on our list when we seek to live out our faith on a daily basis. But I think if we are honest with ourselves, we have a pretty strong natural aversion to it. I think sacrifice is something that may make us start to feel a little bit a little bit nervous. It might make our heart begin to beat a little bit faster. We might begin to come up with excuses in our head as to why we can't sacrifice. That's kind of what we talked about last week. We talked about how usually when we are faced with the call to sacrifice or the reality of sacrifice or the charge to sacrifice, that we would usually typically prefer to say no to that. And how plain and simple Jesus calls us to say yes. And how what we see in the scripture is that when we are faced with that reality of sacrifice and we would prefer to say no, Jesus looks at us and says, I know that you'd rather avoid this, but this is something that you're going to have to do if you want to be a follower of mine. We talked about how over the course of scripture, God does his very best work through people who are willing to sacrifice and how God himself does his best work through sacrifice. We defined sacrifice as well, a definition that we're going to continue to lean on today. It's this, giving up something that you love for something that you love more. And how our willingness to do this, 
to give up something that we love for something that we love more is essential to following Jesus. It's a spiritual practice that we're, we're going to have to engage in eventually if we want to follow Christ to the highest degree. And it is something that the disciples had to do right out of the gate. In our reading for today, we learn that Peter and Andrew, brothers, are both fishermen. And we also learn that James and his brother John are also both fishermen. And they are called to be Jesus' very first disciples. And this moment that we just read, it is brief. It is, it is only five verses, but it is an important moment as Jesus is beginning to get his public ministry off of the ground. Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee. He sees two of those brothers, Peter and Andrew, and they are casting a net into the sea. And he says, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And they drop their nets and they follow him. Then he sees two other brothers, James and John, and they aren't casting their nets, they are mending their nets. And he calls them too. And they leave their boat and their nets and their father behind and they follow him. You've heard this story before, right? I'm sure, I'm sure you have. This is a story that we reference a lot in church. And the temptation that we face when we revisit a story that we are familiar with with is to think that we already know all that we need to know about it. The temptation is for us to click into autopilot. And I am reminded time and time again that that is not how Scripture works. That no matter how many times we have read it, God has something new for us in each season. And in this season for me, looking at this story through the lens of stewardship and through the lens of sacrifice, I was struck by something this week that I think we are supposed to notice about this moment. And it is something that is very simple, but I think we're supposed to see it. When Jesus calls these disciples in each instance, their hands are full. And in both cases, their hands are full with their nets. Peter and Andrew are using that net to fish. James and John are mending their nets. But each time Jesus calls them, their hands are full of something that is of high, something that is of extremely high value for them. In the ancient Near East, people fished with hooks and spears and nets. But by and large, the most efficient way to catch fish was with nets. I mean, if you were fishing to provide for your family or for yourself, you were going to be using a net. And there were, of course, different types of nets used for different methods of fishing during different times of the day. Peter and Andrew are throwing a cast net, which is just a wide circular net with weights that sinks to the bottom and you cinch it down once it goes down as far as you'd like for it to go. And James and John are mending their nets, which was one of the most important skills for a fisherman, just as important as catching fish for an ancient Near East fisherman, because these nets were made of linen, which was a very common fabric at the time, but they had to be extremely careful with it. These nets that they used had to be detangled, cleaned, and dried every single day after every use, or they would quickly rot and be ruined. I mean, most of a fisherman's life in the ancient Near East was spent mending their nets, whether it be fixing holes or detangling it or drilling holes in rocks and tying them to the bottom of the nets. There was almost always a net that needed to be mended. Most folks think that, that James and John were mending a, a trammel net, which was a net that was used in the evenings to fish because it relied on fish swimming through a net that they couldn't see in the dark. It was a net that had three different layers to it, each layer getting tighter and tighter with the mesh. So a fish would pass through it until it eventually hit mesh that was small enough to tangle it up and they would catch the fish. So the more fish you caught the evening prior, 
the more mending and detangling and cleaning you had to do the next morning. I tell you all of this to try to get you to see that what these fishermen dropped to become disciples of Jesus Christ, what they left on the ground, what they sacrificed, it wasn't just their nets. I think that's the temptation when we read this story because we've heard it so many times before. It wasn't just their nets, though. I mean, the nets they were holding were were an extension of, of who they were. It represented their, their livelihood and their identity, their family history and their, and their family's future. It represented all of the work that they had put into these nets, building them and maintaining them and cleaning them and drying them and detangling them. I mean, it may sound silly to say, but I think it's true. The nets that they dropped were probably pretty close to being at the center of their lives. And when Jesus comes up to them, when he calls them, their their hands are full. Their hands are full of something that is a part of who they are. And in order to follow him, they have to be willing to drop it. And the more that I thought about it this week, the more I realized that, that most of the time our hands are full too, aren't they? As I continue on this journey of, of being a parent, I have realized more and more that a child's life is full of different phases. Every season brings a new phase with it. And uh, Madison, my wife, and I, we, we have one son. He's, he's about two and a half years old. And he is currently in the phase that I call the stuff phase. Every morning, I take Reed to school because Madison has to be at work earlier than I do. And every morning when we are leaving the house, Reed has to get all of his stuff. We can't leave the house, actually, and and make the trek to school without tears and a pretty substantial meltdown unless Reed has all of his, all of his stuff, which I know what you're thinking. It probably sounds really simple, doesn't it? But let me tell you what his stuff actually entails, okay? His sunglasses, which he usually wears upside down, I don't know why, a green pair of gardening gloves that he has to put on, he can't just carry them, he has to be wearing them in the car on the way to school, his Christmas jingle bells, because his favorite song is still Frank Sinatra's version of jingle bells, a plastic set of keys, an orange shaker, because he's being raised to live a life to celebrate bye weeks, just like I do his plastic phone so he can call all of his friends on the way to school, his water bottle, little puppy, not to be confused with big puppy, it has to be little puppy, and a book, the book of the week, really. This past week it was a book called The Pout Pout Fish. And I don't know if you were counting, but that is nine things that we have to have in our hands before we can leave the house Nine things that every time we leave for school, Reed is trying to find or carry or wear. And to say that his hands are full is an understatement, y'all. I mean, to be clear, it is more stuff than he can physically carry, which is hard for him to reconcile every morning. We have to do it all over again. What is dad going to carry and what is Reed going to carry? And heaven forbid if we get to the truck and we realize that we have forgotten something essential for the journey, if he's missing his bells or his phone or his keys, I have to go back and find it. Or I have to accept the ride to school is not going to be full of joy. And I have to say, to see him walking around the house collecting all of that, all of that stuff, trying to carry all of that stuff, Dropping one thing as he picks up something else and then getting frustrated and trying to pick it up again. Knowing that his emotional state, his emotional well-being, it depends on him being able to carry all of this stuff. He looks ridiculous. And I can only imagine that that's how we often look to God. Because, I mean, come on. When God calls us, usually our hands are full too. I mean, they may not be full of fishing nets or plastic keys or jingle bells or upside down sunglasses or a pout pout. I mean, you get it, right? They may not be full of that stuff, but our hands are full of stuff. And some of it, don't get me wrong, is is really important stuff. 
I mean, we're all trying to carry family stuff and work stuff and personal stuff and kids stuff and spouse stuff and world stuff. We're carrying political stuff right now. We're carrying stuff with our friends and our relationships, stuff that's just for fun. We carry that too. I mean, the list could go on and on, but it's not just that, right? I mean, our budgets are full too. Our schedules are, are full. Our daily energy consumption, the amount of energy it takes us to just get through the day. For a lot of us, we feel like we're pretty maxed out on that, that that meter is full, that it takes a full tank each and every day. Usually when God calls us, our hands are full. Because our hands are always full, aren't they? What we have to learn is that in order to follow him, in order to say yes to that call, we have to be willing to do what the disciples are able to do and what Reed is currently not willing to do. To sacrifice, to drop something that we love so that we can pick up, so that we can go and do, so that we can be a part of something that we have decided we love more. I mean, what is it that you need to let go of? What is it that you need to, to release? What is it that you need to leave in your past? so that you can take that next step in your walk with Christ. I mean, the truth is that so much of this stewardship conversation is really just a conversation about priorities. I mean, the reason we do this every year, the reason we, we revisit this topic each and every year is because I think at least once a year, we need to take some time to reevaluate what we have made a priority in our life. Because we can only do so much. We only have so much time and so much energy and so much money. We can only hold on to so many things at one time. And so often we're holding on to the wrong stuff. What is it that you've allowed to take up too much space, too much time, too many resources in your life? What is it that you have made room for in your arms amongst all the other things that you're trying to carry that really you just need to let go of? What shouldn't be nearly as high on your priority list as you have allowed it to be? Because look, here's the truth for those disciples. The text we read last week, Jesus says this, if any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And what we can see from our seat reading the gospel narrative is that if they wouldn't have been able or wouldn't have been willing to drop their nets, they wouldn't have been able to pick up their cross because their hands would have been too full. And the same is true for us. Look, I, I know that your hands are full because my hands are full too. But friends, hear me. Eventually following Jesus is going to call us to sacrifice. We're going to have to be willing to give up something that we love for something that we love more. We're going to have to be willing to drop our nets too. The question, I think, is not, should we or can we do this? Or even how can we do this? I think the question that we're left with this morning is very simply, will we? Will we give up something that we love for something that we have decided we love more? And I sure hope that for us as a church, the answer to that question is yes. Because friends, Christ is still calling. And there is still plenty of work to be done. And I don't think there's anyone better for the job than us. In the name of the Father and the Son 
and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks for how you call us. For how you call us into a life of purpose. A life where we trust, Lord, that when we say yes to you, we will be used. That we will be put to work. That we will be a part of this movement of your kingdom spreading and growing and sharing. But I pray, God, that you might give us boldness and courage in our faith so that when you do call, Lord, we'll be ready. We'll be ready to drop our nets. We'll be willing to leave whatever it is we need to leave in the past so that we can follow you into the future that you have planned for us, Lord, a future that I believe is a future with hope, a future full of promises that we can trust you will keep, a future that entails us being a part, Lord, of spreading your light and sharing your gospel and living out your love and being grounded in your hope and a people of your peace, a people that I don't think any of us want to miss out on being, Lord. Give us courage, Father. Give us a faith that can move mountains so that when you call, because you will, Lord, so that when you call, we might have the courage to say yes. We love you, Lord. It's your name we pray. Amen.